Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Joyce, and thank you for inviting me here. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here today. If we can just find my mouse, we'll be all set. Okay, so uh, I'm here to talk to you today about digital immersive experiences and bringing magical experiences into the real world. The title of my talk is Human Sensory Systems, Perception and Digital Immersive Experiences. Uh, as Joyce mentioned, I'm the Chief Science and Experience Officer of Magic Leap and a, a co-founder as well. And my talk today will begin by talking about uh, what we mean by digital immersive experiences and different varieties of digital immersive experiences. And we'll discuss characteristics of the human visual system especially from the viewpoint of how it influences our choices about how to design immersive headsets and how to capture content. And uh, throughout that discussion of the human visual system, I will be making recommendations uh, to headset developers and, uh, and then ending with recommendations to immersive storytellers. So what do we mean by digital immersive experiences? So I consider digital immersive experiences to be a new medium I think that virtual and mixed reality provide the opportunity for radically more immersive experiences of narrative. Uh, but these experiences really comprise a novel art form. So I expect them to diverge from current cinema in a similar fashion to the way that radio plays evolved into television. And uh, certain techniques that worked well in radio plays might not have been as effective in, in television. Similarly, we have to adapt our storytelling uh, for these new, uh, this new medium. And storytellers are really just at the beginning of, of the exploration of the affordances of this, this new cinematic medium. And by understanding details of the human sensory system and perceptual systems, that can help to inform the choices we make when shooting content for this medium and uh, designing the headsets. And I think it's also worth uh, clarifying that digital immersive experiences come in a number of different flavors. So uh, one way of categorizing these experiences is to divide them up in terms of uh, headsets that block out the entire world completely so that you're fully immersed in the fantasy world. Uh, we typically refer to that as virtual reality, VR, and those systems that uh, blend digital content with our view of the real world, uh, commonly referred to as mixed reality or augmented reality. Uh, mixed reality and augmented reality can further be divided up into systems that allow direct viewing of the real world uh, through transparent display systems and those that relay captured or synthesized imagery uh, of the real world and they relay that to an opaque headset, essentially a VR headset. So what should we be aiming for when we design headsets? Reality, of course, is, is infinitely detailed. Uh, that's a very high bar to aim for. Uh, uh, but fortunately, we don't need to reproduce every atom of reality in order to create a very engaging experience. Instead, it's important to target matching the capabilities of the human visual system and perceptual systems in general. So we'll talk today about the human visual system uh, to help to better inform the specifications for an ideal headset. And uh, I think it's also worthwhile to point out that understanding the human visual system well also allows us to gracefully deviate from the platonic ideal of a headset. Uh, and know which shortcuts are going to cause discomfort in a user versus uh, just lowering the sense of realism to some degree. So first, some general comments about, about perception. So I think of the brain as a powerful correlation and prediction system. We have information flowing into our various sensory modalities, and uh, these this flow of information is highly correlated. So the information that I receive in, through my visual system is highly correlated with the information that I receive from my vestibular sense system, my sense of balance, and my auditory system, my sense of hearing as well. Uh, and we rely heavily upon the correlations between these disparate sensory modalities. And, and really, our perceptions are often shaped by the unique interactions between the sensory modalities. So for instance, if 
you play audio clips of somebody pronouncing various phonemes like ba, ga, da, etc. And you play a video clip of lips that are moving, making different phonemes. You can get people to hallucinate a different phoneme than is created by either the audio clip or the video clip. So they try to, the brain tries to determine what, which uh, phoneme must be created based on the physical motion of the lips and the auditory signal. Uh, it's, it's a really a very low level effect and, and quite compelling. Uh, similarly, there's been uh, interesting research in the, the phantom limb uh, area regarding uh, interactions between the visual sense and the tactile sense. So if somebody loses uh, a limb, for instance, an arm, uh, they will often have a sensation that they, the arm is still there. They have this phantom limb uh, association. And uh, the work of Ramachandran in UCSD has shown that an effective way of of getting the user to relearn that the limb is no longer present is to present the user with visual stimuli, essentially a simulated reflection of him or herself. Uh, and, and interestingly, as, as sort of an aside, uh, he has mentioned to me that uh, this, this correlation system is so powerful that uh, even if you, if for instance, you have somebody sit at a table and you trace a pattern on the person's leg with one hand that's hidden by the table, and at the same time you trace the same pattern with the other hand on the top of the table, the, the subject will begin to associate that region of the table with uh, the tactile stimulation that they're receiving on their leg. And if you then, for instance, slap the table, they will often think they're going to experience uh, a sensation of pain. They'll, they'll, they'll jump. Uh, uh, so it, it's the brain very readily maps all correlated input uh, to its overall perception. Uh, so, so these inputs are highly correlated. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that each of these sensory modalities is often fairly lossy and the brain actively discards as much information as it can in order to increase the computational efficiency of the brain. If we didn't discard this information, we'd be walking around with brains the size of refrigerators to crunch all of the data that our, our various uh, receptors are feeding the brain. And the good news is that if we provide highly correlated information about digital objects and take shortcuts that match the same shortcuts that the human visual system takes, then the brain helps us out and fills in a lot of the, the uh, detail. So uh, in particular, the human visual system reconstructs depth information from two-dimensional images. So we have the sense that we're inside a volumetric three-dimensional space, but we only uh, look through the glass darkly. We, we sample this, this space with essentially 2D imagers in the form of our retinas, and uh, we have to infer the three-dimensional relationships within the world based on relatively sparse information amongst these, these various sensory modalities. And we also don't just passively sense the world and drink in the detail, but rather we actively scan the world. So uh, rather than thinking of the eyes as a camera that's pointed at the world. I think it's often more useful to think of the eyes as, as a scanner, like one of these handheld scanners that are used to capture an image of a page by slowly drawing it across the page. For instance, we have a very high resolution center of our vision, uh, our, our fovea, and that resolution very dramatically falls off with uh, eccentricity as we move towards the periphery. Uh, but yet, I have the perception that I'm looking at a high-resolution room right now, and all of these people uh, have sharply resolved features. Uh, but that's because I have a little keyhole of, of high resolution that's flying around the scene at my, my beck and call. And I have a, a sense memory of the high-resolution uh, information that I gathered as the system was sweeping across the, uh, the scene. Um, so how do we build these mental representations of 3D spaces. We do so with a suite of depth cues and oculomotor processes. Uh, a few of the cues that I'll talk about today are pictorial uh, depth cues, and then I'll talk about the oculomotor processes of accommodation, invergence, and the process of stereopsis, of stereovision. 
So I won't go into great detail regarding pictorial depth cues, but just provide a high level uh, description uh, given the time that we have here. So pictorial depth cues are often referred to as uh, painter's cues because these are the kinds of cues that can be represented within a two-dimensional medium such as a painting. And uh, they're also present in your, tele your, uh, your common television screen. And these cues include interposition, so if one hand is in front of the other hand, you assume that it's in front of that hand. Uh, relative size, height and field, so as an object uh, moves away from the horizon, it's perceived as, as coming closer to you. Uh, linear perspective, so train tracks receding into the, uh, into the distance and converging. And texture gradients, shape from shading, and, and haze. So it, it's a bit of a misnomer to call this screen, for instance, uh, a, a 2D experience because I can present imagery on this, this flat layer that does provide depth cues to the human visual system. So when we talk about 3D displays, we're really talking about incorporating more of the depth cues uh, into the experience and ensuring that those depth cues are all highly correlated with one another. So uh, it's also critically important to understand the oculomotor processes that help to steer the human visual system as we scan the world around us. And uh, two of the important ones to understand are ocular accommodation and convergence. So these, these uh, ocular motor processes are necessary to coordinate the actions of the two eyes and form clear images on the retinas. And sensory feedback about the position of the muscles that control our eye position uh, yields depth information to the visual system. And interestingly, these, these motor control systems are neurologically cross-coupled to one another for long-term efficiency and, and reliability. So again, all of this, this input is, is highly, <laughs> I think Siri has a comment for us. Uh, uh, so these, uh, uh, these, these systems, again, uh, the, the information presented to these systems is, is highly, highly correlated and we've evolved to take advantage of these, these correlations and we automatically uh, cross-couple the driving of one system to match the anticipated uh, location of an object, for instance, based on the information from a different system. So the uh, first process I'll talk about is, is accommodation. So, just like a camera, the eye has a limited depth of focus or depth of field. And in order to form a clear image upon our retina, uh, we have to be able to actively adjust our focus. So just as a camera uh, is, is not able to simultaneously focus upon the salt and pepper shaker and it shifts its focus by translating a lens forward and back, uh, we also have a uh, a method for changing the optical focus of our eyes, and this process is known as accommodation. So uh, I think it's useful to talk a little bit about how, what, what the job of the eye's optical system is. So if we have a, a point out in the scene, light from the sun or from an overhead light reflects from the point on an object and radiates in all directions some subset of the rays that are emerging from this point source of light reach the aperture of our eye and the uh, cornea and the crystalline lens that sits behind the cornea have to take this, this diverging wavefront and bend that light down, refract it down so that it falls upon a small point upon the retina. And if we have multiple points that are uh, emitting light, then we want to map each of those multiple points to small, clearly resolved spots upon the retina. So, uh, and as I mentioned, the, we don't focus upon a, a single infinitesimally small point at any point in time. Instead, as I look out into this room, there's a huge volumetric model in front of me, if you will, comprising many uh, point sources, a, point, a cloud of point sources, 
and I can only focus upon a subset of those at any point in time. So I, I think about this a little bit uh, like throwing pebbles into a pool and these uh, wave fronts all radiating from different uh, pebbles that have been thrown into the pool. Similarly, an object is acting as a, uh, as a cluster of point sources of light. So if we, if we focus on, on one point, again, we can control the focus system of our eye to bend that light down to a sharply resolved point. However, if there is a point that is closer to us, then for a given accommodation state, that light will not be bent strongly enough to converge upon the retina, but instead will come to a point behind the retina, yielding a, a blurry spot upon the retina. And similarly, if there's an object that is farther away uh, than the plane of focus, then that object is uh, refracted too strongly and brought into a point of focus in front of the retina, and it diverges and produces a Gaussian blur, blur, spot, blur spot on the, uh, on the retina itself. So how do we do this? Uh, in contrast to a camera lens, we don't physically translate a large crystalline lens forward and back, but instead the uh, crystalline lens is an elastic lens, and if we took it out of the eye, it would adopt a fairly spherical shape. But when placed in the eye, it has a number of zonual fibers attached around its radius that are pulling upon the lens to create it uh, a flatter shape uh, and lower its optical power. And as the ciliary muscle that holds these zonual fibers contracts, uh, the tension on the zonual fibers decreases and allowing the lens to adopt a more spherical, spherical configuration. So uh, the other process that's, that's important to understand is that of ocular vergence. So uh, as I mentioned previously, the resolution across our eye is, uh, is not equal. So we have a very high resolution in the macula lutea in the, the center of the fovea of the eye about 120 cones per visual degree, but that resolution falls off very rapidly. So it behooves us to look directly at an object if we want to see it clearly, and indeed that's what we do. So uh, as I look at my fingertip, I rotate the lines of sight of my eyes to converge upon my fingertip, and as I move it closer to my face, I more strongly converge the line of sights of, of my eyes, and as I move it far away, I deconverge my eyes, and if I move that object uh, infinitely far away, then the eyes are substantially parallel. Okay, so the other uh, process, and the one uh, with which I think probably most, in the most of the people in the room here are, are familiar, is the process of stereopsis. So the, we have two eyes, they're separated by roughly 60 three millimeters and thus have slightly different viewpoints on the same scene. And in the process of stereopsis, the visual system is comparing the images received by the left eye and the right eye and looking at disparities in where pixels fall between the two images. And uh, this process is uh, highly interacting with uh, vergence. So if I pick an object to fixate upon, such as the tip of my finger, I converge my eyes to the tip of my finger and also focus the lenses of my eyes to that same distance. And if, uh, if we look at a, a curved plane that passes through that point, there are a number of locations that fall upon corresponding points of our retina. So the, the point upon which I'm fixating uh, falls on the center of the fovea, the dotted line in the uh, right-hand illustration, and then uh, roughly in correspondence with the, the plane of that fixation point, uh, there are a number of other points uh, at which if I place a point source of light there, it will then be focused upon corresponding points between the left and right eyes. If, however, I place an object in front of my position of fixation, then the light will fall on uh, non-corresponding points of the retina, so they'll be shifted out towards my temples. Uh, and similarly, if I place an object behind my fixation point, then those uh, points will be shifted nasally uh, on, my, on my hemi-retinas. Uh, 
And so these, these disparities between uh, pixel locations provides uh, a strong depth cue as to the location of, of a 3D object. So a point I want to emphasize is that uh, accommodation and virgins and stereopsis are all linked. So uh, viewing an object clearly requires a simultaneous shift of accommodation and virgence. So for instance, if I look at a real object that's very far away, then I uh, converge my eyes at that distance and uh, also focus the lenses of my eyes, the crystalline lens, uh, to bring the diverging wavefront illustrated here in, in purple uh, into focus on my retina. An object that's sitting in front of that object, say a, a tree in the foreground, uh, that is in front of my fixation point is uh, going to stimulate non-corresponding points upon my, uh, my retina and it will be defocused. Uh, so you can see here in the illustration below that the house is in sharp focus and the tree is slightly blurred. And as I shift my gaze from a distant object to a near object, in order to see that new object clearly, I have to simultaneously change the convergence angle of my eyes and the focus of the crystalline lens of my eyes. So nature has taken a shortcut and just hard cross, cross couple those two systems, hardwired the connection between them. So if I, if I change my focus to one position, I will automatically converge to the same distance. So in fact, if I even, if I close my left eye and I follow my finger back and forth, the accommodation changes that I'm making to keep my finger in sharp focus are causing my left eye to make convergence motions that match, even though the left eye is not receiving any direct stimulation. So uh, this cross-coupling between accommodation and convergence is, is highly useful when looking at real objects. It's part of what allows me to rapidly slew my gaze around the room and reconstruct a high-resolution 3D model uh, in my brain of this room. Um, however, it does make things a bit tricky for display uh, developers, uh, especially uh, when developing what we call, uh, tend to call 3D displays. So uh, the, the approach of a stereoscopic display uh, has, has been kicking around for quite some time. Uh, the early incarnations involve taking two uh, cameras, separating them by some distance, and photographing a scene from two different viewpoints, and providing a viewer that allowed the left eye to only see the left camera's image and the right eye to see the right camera's uh, image. And this can provide a, a partial illusion of the 3D relationships within a scene. Uh, however, uh, what's non-ideal about this approach is that in order to represent an object that's at some plane other than the plane of, of uh, focus, the uh, binocular disparities are created within this image that give the user the illusion that the object is sitting behind the plane of the, of the photograph or the display. So the user stereoscopically perceives the object to be at location A. However, all of the light is actually coming from a flat plane at the optical distance of the photograph or the LCOS display, for instance. And uh, what that means is that the individual point sources of light are all placed at a different plane of focus. So uh, this configuration requires a user to converge at one distance and focus at an unmatching uh, distance. And that's uh, illustrated here. So uh, in the degenerate case in which the object distance matches the actual focus of the display, then, uh, then uh, the user exciting. Um, the user focuses upon uh, the, ha the house and, uh, and uh, converges on the, on the house as well. And uh, this doesn't create any sort of conflict between the accommodation and vergence system. However, it does create sort of a dollhouse-like effect in which even though the tree in the foreground ought to be blurred given the, uh, its location within the field, it's just as sharp as the house is because it's physically at the same plane of focus. And things get a little bit worse when we try to focus uh, and fixate upon an object that's off the designed focus plane of, of the display. Uh, so if I look at an object that's stereoscopically rendered closer, then I 
converge my eyes, uh, and that convergence elicits an automatic change in the focus of my eyes, but that focus now brings my, the optical focus away from the plane of focus of the display. Uh, and so that provides, a, the, the blur that results from that provides a cue for my focus system to shift back to the display focus level, which then pulls my convergence uh, to that level, causing diplopia, double vision. And it sets up this tug of war within the human visual system in which accommodation is trying to get both processes to uh, focus and converge on one distance, and uh, the convergence cues are, are trying to get both processes to converge and focus at the other distance. And that tug of war within the human visual system can uh, be a significant factor in eye strain associated with, with stereoscopic displays. So uh, what's ideal is to make a volumetric light field display. And what I mean by this is a display that correctly recreates all of the depth cues present under natural viewing conditions, including ocular accommodation. Uh, um, one motivation to do that is to enable the recoupling of, of the accommodation vergence linkage that's broken with conventional stereo approaches. And a high quality volumetric display uh, can also increase the subjective feeling of depth. And uh, just to give you a, a schematic visual about uh, one, one way of implementing a, a volumetric light field display is that the, the individual pixels or voxels that, that comprise an image are physically distributed throughout space. So rather than presenting a flat image to the left eye and a flat image to the right eye, we're presenting a sculpture of light, if you will, in which different points along that sculpture are, are optically located at different uh, focus distances. And the human eye interacts with that sculpture of light in the same way that it interacts with sculptures that have real mass, and it can change its ocular uh, accommodation and bring different points on that object into and out of focus. Okay, so uh, quickly discuss some other considerations when designing headsets. So uh, what's, what's the highest bar we could shoot for in terms of, of reproducing the resolution of the real world or, or really, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's most practical to think about the resolution of the human visual system. So the resolution of the eye is measured as a function of angle, and we typically refer to it uh, in the unit of minutes of arc. So a, a minute of arc is, is equal to 1 60th of a, of a visual degree. And I mentioned previously that in the fovea, there are about 120 photoreceptors per visual degree. So that corresponds, um, given Nyquist sampling limits, to an ability to clearly resolve two points that are separated by about one arc minute. And interestingly, the optics of the eye, the quality of the optics of the eye, is typically well matched to the Nyquist sampling limits. So the ability to bend light down to a small spot uh, is, a, is about uh, one arc minute as well. Uh, and this also corresponds uh, well with, uh, with Snell and Acuity uh, measurements coming in around one arc minute. Uh, interestingly, if we view not just two points in space, but extended lines, then the visual system aggregates the behavior across uh, the, all of the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells connecting them to the visual cortex uh, to achieve a super resolution. So uh, when we're looking at extended lines, uh, we can actually resolve far finer uh, differences in position uh, up to about 0 0.13 uh, arc minutes. Uh, and this is typically referred to as vernier acuity. So if we use uh, these two numbers, and we try to think about what sort of panel size we would need to completely reproduce uh, the full resolution for the, the, uh, across the entire human field of view. Uh, the, the monocular field of view, so the field of view for a single eye, if I keep my head position still but allow myself to move my eyes completely freely, 
the monocular field of view is 225 degrees by about 148 uh, degrees vertical. And if we use that, that metric of uh, one arc minute uh, Snellen acuity across the field, then a, a panel to drive that full resolution would be about 120 megapixels, so 13,500 pixels by almost 9,000 pixels. Uh, if we use the, the metric of vernier acuity, then the situation is, uh, is more dramatic. Uh, to fully create all of those pixels uh, to saturate the human eye would require uh, about 104,000 uh, pixels by, by 68,000 pixels, or about seven gigapixels. Uh, so that's a pretty aggressive number. If you, if you look at current uh, panel display technologies, uh, We've, we've recently uh, broken under uh, four micron pixel pitch. Uh, so if we look at, for instance, the Jasper display at 3.74 microns, then an image source that would cover the entire visual field uh, with those resolution criteria would be about uh, 51 millimeters by, by 33 millimeters, uh, or for the vernier acuity, you know, 39 centimeters by 26 centimeters, which would be a bit much for a, a headset. Uh, so, so how do we how do we cheat? Uh, so, uh, again, it turns out that the resolution is not distributed equally across the retina. We have a very high acuity in the center of our fovea, and then this acuity rapidly falls off with uh, with eccentricity as we move away from the center of the field. So uh, one approach is to make a high resolution display that uh, only covers the area in which the high resolution center of the retina can sample from the scene. So our, our eyes are able to, to rotate the center of the view uh, about 129 degrees in the horizontal axis and 114 degrees in the vertical axis. So using this, uh, this index, then one arc minute across the range of fixation is a, is a more moderate uh, 7,740 pixels by uh, 6,840 pixels. And uh, that's still relatively high, but it's starting to become tractable. And uh, I'll also mention that accurate and very fast eye tracking can enable further optimization in the form of, for instance, foveated displays and that can uh, provide an advantage on the uh, rendering efficiency size as well. Okay, so I, I know I'm running, running short on time here, so I'll, I'll fly through these other uh, slides. Um, eye box size uh, is influenced by the, the field of view of the display. So as, as we look through larger fields of view, we rotate our eyes and translate our pupils through a larger eye box. So if, uh, if we want the image to not start to vignette and fall off as we're rotating our eyes, then uh, for a, for instance, a, a 100 degree field of view, we would require an eye box that would be about 25 millimeters uh, in width, uh, which can be a challenge for certain, certain optical systems. Uh, I'll also mention that in optically see-through augmented reality and mixed reality systems, it's preferable to have the image remain visible even when we're looking far off axis at an object in the real world that might be at a field of view that's larger than the, the, the display field of view. So that increases the bar for uh, the size of the eye box. And if you make a headset that does not in build in a mechanical adjust of the uh, interpupillary distance, then it's useful to create an even larger eye box so you can accommodate uh, variations in the distance between different users' pupils. Uh, the interpupillary distance uh, varies widely, but I think I'll skip through this uh, since it's a less critical slide. Uh, so I, I think folks here are fairly familiar with uh, motion sickness uh, considerations with uh, immersive displays. Our vestibular system senses the position of our heads, and when we see a mismatch between the motion perceived by our visual system and the vestibular system, then that will manifest in uh, a nauseated response. 
So uh, it's, it's important to minimize the latency. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pass through this as uh, I think this has been discussed uh, at greater length by others, and I'm, I'm out, of, out of time here, I think. Um, I'll, just, I'll just end with some, some general recommendations for immersive storytellers. So I would recommend to minimize the visual vestibular conflict that any viewer motion in the scene should be mapped to the actual locomotion of the viewer. Uh, so rather than having capturing content in which a camera is moving through the scene, it's preferable to capture the content with a stationary camera. And also, rather than allowing a user to, for instance, use a game pad to, to change position within a scene, it's better to allow the user to physically walk through the scene so that the vestibular cues match the, the visual cues. Uh, in some cases, some viewers can tolerate some uh, slow forward motion uh, that isn't controlled by, by their actual locomotion, but it's preferable to, uh, to keep the cues matching. Uh, so the, the, the lowest, uh, lowest bar for, for capture for these systems, I believe, is, uh, is a simple single camera capture, a wide field of view camera, or ideally a 360 degree uh, camera. In this configuration, I would uh, recommend that the uh, focus of the camera be set at infinity, that the uh, headset uh, display the scene uh, at optical infinity and in a biocular fashion, so the same image to each eye, essentially non-stereoscopic or creating a stereoscopic cue that the objects are very far away. Uh, and in order to not create uh, conflicts uh, for non-light field displays, then the content uh, capture system should not allow objects to get very close to the user. So the objects should remain a few meters away to minimize the cue conflicts between uh, accommodation and vergence, and also the uh, stereo mismatch in this case. Uh, I don't recommend capturing these scenes with a single pair of stereo uh, cameras. Uh, because uh, when viewers inevitably move their heads, the eyes are going to shift from the correct zone for stereo viewing, the, the locations where the cameras were placed, uh, causing significant distortions. Uh, and if instead you just keep the image stuck to the head, so as I move my head around, the image moves with it, then you're uh, creating visual vestibular conflicts. So preferable is to capture a scene with a multi-camera light field capture scene. Um, so this is an excellent configuration for live capture. Um, ideally, one would like to post-process the data to create a volumetric model of the scene, allowing interpolation uh, for different interpupillary distance of users and to enable some uh, head motion parallax as well. And uh, preferably, these cameras would then uh, display the scene on a multi-focus light field uh, display. Uh, if a uh, multi-focus light field display is not uh, available, then I, again, I would recommend to keep objects uh, farther away from the viewer, uh, at least 1.7 meters away, and place the focus of the display around 3.3 meters. Uh, even better is a massively multi-camera light field capture system in which uh, light field systems are distributed throughout a space. And this configuration can allow a user to walk through a scene and view the scene from, from different distances. And then finally, if uh, you synthetically generate the, uh, the imagery uh, via computer, uh, computer graphics and animation, then uh, you can reap the similar benefits to a massively multi-camera light field capture system and have a great deal of control. Uh, okay, so finally, uh, classical cinema techniques that, that may not translate as well into the new medium. Uh, I already mentioned camera motion. Uh, I would also caution against lenses that distort the scene, such as fish, fisheye lenses and anamorphic lenses. Uh, jump cuts, I think, can be more disturbing in an immersive uh, storytelling experience. Uh, as well as presenting objects at a false scale. So if you zoom in on a person's face, one has to be careful not to create the percept that you're looking at a face that's six, six feet tall. Uh, and, and then additionally, it's a bit more complicated to control viewer attention through uh, camera focus, although subtle manipulations might be effective. Okay, so uh, thank you.
thank you very much. <laughs> and